Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to discuss my plastic surgery. I'm really excited about this, you guys. I posted about my surgery uh, about a month after I had it done, and I put it in the community tab here on YouTube. And of course, I've shared about it a bunch in between then and now in videos, but I've never gone real deep into all of it. I've just kind of explained what I did. Today, we're gonna do that. I'm actually going to kind of tell you what led me to get the surgery. And I'm also going to share a little snippet from my interview with the doctor that did my surgery. And then I'm going to share a bunch of progress pictures. So I'm going to share the pictures from the day after surgery all the way through, I think about five ish weeks. And just know that those are snapshots. I was recovering. So I was literally taking them with my phone and I have a bunch to share, but some of them are, you know, not particularly perfect pictures. They're in all kinds of different lighting. Some of them have makeup on, but I shared those on purpose because I think they'll be helpful for those of you kind of wondering how you can cover your scars or how you can hide them, things like that. So I'm trying to share as many pictures as possible just to help out because after I had the surgery, I was laid up at my parents' house. I went home to my parents' house and I found that I really wanted to see how other people healed from this surgery. And so I'm hoping that this might help some people out there who like me are curious about that or need reassurance, etc. If you're new here, my name is Penny. I'm a master esthetician in Portland, Oregon, and I love skincare. I love skincare. I love self-care. I love anything that is empowering or makes us feel like the best version of ourselves. I do not feel like there's any shame in Botox or fillers or surgery. None of those things. If you want to do nothing ever in your life but wear sunscreen, I think that's awesome. So everyone is welcome here. So please be kind in the comments because honestly, it's slightly vulnerable to share this kind of information, especially on this platform. You know, you would be shocked at the mean girl mentality of, you know, the comments that can be shared. It's incredible. So please don't do that. There's no room for that in this day and age. I'm going to actually take you back to my very first video on YouTube. And ironically, it is about my submental and my neck. And that's actually kind of how I started my YouTube channel. I was interested in doing Kybella because I had submental fat and I didn't have a very defined jawline. Never did. I never did even when I was a kid. I was very athletic and you know it had nothing to do with you know excess weight or not or anything like that. As everybody will tell you, some people just have the anatomy that they have and that was me. I had some submental. And essentially what Kybella does is it's an, an injection of a substance that goes in and it basically liquefies the fat and then your lymphatic system takes it away. It is not a pretty process. It actually makes you look pretty crazy during the middle of it. So we're going to roll that and then we'll come back and we'll chat about where that took me over several years. Okay, so this is in my first video and it's right before I'm going to get my Kybella. And you can see there's it's just a little bit of submental fat. Honestly, I'm filming this with a webcam, so it's uh, kind of flattering, honestly. This is after I had Kybella that night. You can see how much it swells up. And what's happening now is that acid is going in there and it's causing a bunch of inflammation and hopefully melting fat, right? Okay, several weeks go by. This is like five or six weeks later. And there really isn't a huge change at this point from my baseline. I mean, I'd say there's a tiny bit of, you know, fat gone. I'm 43 years old in this video. Now we can fast forward to age 47 and you can see that what it looks like to me is a deflated balloon. The fat actually was indeed gone. And because of my, the aging process, I had laxity because I had had that fat under my chin my whole entire life. And now it was gone. And as you age, this happens. Now, these are the most unflattering pictures I could ever possibly take. You guys, I put the phone like below me. So just know that probably nobody else would ever have seen those pictures, but here we are. That took me to surgery. Okay. So as you can see, I felt like I had a pretty good reason for wanting to do something about the submental area 
after doing Kybella. There's certainly an argument. People could say you didn't even need to do Kybella to begin with. And I, I can appreciate that. But again, it was just something that I felt like bothered me. And I thought that that injectable would take care of that little pooch. And then I thought I was young enough that my skin would just retract. Well, I had some of that, but as I aged, that fat actually was my friend and it was gone. And so because that skin had sat on that fat for four decades, you know, it just kind of left a little bit of laxity right under the chin. This is what brought me to see Dr. Kim. Basically, I got referrals. I did a ton of research and I saw more than one surgeon for consultation before I decided to go with Dr. Kim. I also got referrals that were high quality as far as I was concerned. They weren't from strangers and they weren't from anyone who had anything to benefit from the referral. They were actually from practitioners who knew him in a professional setting and had known him for a long time and had seen his work. And so I felt really, really good about my selection. What I did was I went in asking for something called a platysmoplasty. Now platysmoplasty is a particular particular part of a neck lift and it has to do with the platysma muscle and with the way that they suture it together in the center. That will be covered in my interview with Dr. Kim if you're interested. Now when I asked Dr. Kim in our initial consultation about doing the platysmoplasty, he said that that was a good idea and that that would help to kind of give like a hammock to this area. But he also suggested that I do a deep plane lift. Now that's gonna address the face. Now I have to admit, I'd never heard of a deep plane lift before that consultation with Dr. Kim. And I trusted him based on the referrals that I'd gotten for him and all of the research I'd done on him, his education and our instant rapport, that when he suggested that, I decided that I was going to listen to him because he's going to want the best outcome for me. And if I'm going to trust him with any surgery, I should trust him on his opinion as well. He says that often he doesn't do a lot of a la carte. So he doesn't do a lot of just your lower face or just your neck, unless you're a young person and you're addressing something congenital that maybe bothers you. Maybe you don't have a really sharp chin. You have something that you were just born with and you're young. You have absolutely no reason. You have no laxity in your face whatsoever. Then you might be somebody that can just go get a neck lift, right? But if you're getting older, it's not very often that you're gonna just do one or the other. Now he really prefaced this whole thing with really setting expectations. And I think that that's incredibly important. He told me that as far as my face was concerned, it was going to be really, really subtle. I didn't have much laxity or anything like that, but obviously at 47 years old, I had some and at the jawline to marry it up. Yeah. You're going to get a little bit of a lift and that is going to cause a little bit of a refresh. Now, this is when I decided that I wanted to do an upper blepharoplasty. It's upper eyelid surgery. And I I figured if I'm going to be under general anesthetic, I might as well go ahead and do that. Now I did skin only. So there was no lifting in any of this part of my face. There was no, you know, I didn't mess with the muscle or the fat pads or anything like that. We did not do my lower eyelids. He just simply got rid of some excess skin on my eyelids. Now I'm going to play a little snippet from Dr. Kim so that he can explain what a deep plane lift is and also what a platysmoplasty is so that then when we go into the recovery pictures, you will be able to see what I was recovering from. Well, good morning, Penn. Thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, my name is Michael Kim and I'm a facial plastic surgeon who practices in Portland, Oregon. I have been practicing for about 13 years now after my training had completed. I uh, went to Princeton University for undergraduate studies and uh, then came back to Seattle for medical school, did residency back on the East Coast at Johns Hopkins, and then did a fellowship, one year facial plastic surgery uh, fellowship, and then took a job in Arizona at the Mayo Clinic for two years, returned back to uh, Portland, 
where I was on faculty at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, for eight years, and I started my private practice three years ago. Can you explain to people what is a deep plane lift? And, and then I'd love for you to explain what a platysmoplasty is. So the deep plane facelift is, there are a lot of definitions and it comes down to anatomy. So just using my, my face as an example, you know, as we age, what tends to happen is our soft tissue moves down like a pendulum. And so this soft tissue moves down the jawline and it comes up against this area because this doesn't move. And then it basically has a collision course that creates a jowl and then maybe a marionette line as well. The cheek as well comes down this way and creates a nasolabial fold, not because the fold got deeper. It's more because the soft tissue is resting next to the fold. And so no one does a skin only facelift anymore. What a skin only face a subcutaneous facelift would be is actually making incisions of various variations and lifting that up. So there's a small fat layer underneath the skin and you lift that up, take, take the excess and then trim it away. Now the deep plane facelift, what it does is it lifts that subcutaneous layer, but then it also makes an incision into the next layer. And that next layer is called the SMAS, S-M-A-S. There's various ways to treat the SMAS. Some people uh, will cut a small strip of SMAS. This is underneath the skin. It's called small strip of SMAS. Discard that and then, then close the gap. Others will use techniques where they use sutures to just cinch up the SMAS and not make any cut into it. It's often referred to as a max lift, M-A-C-S lift. And then there are various deep plane lifts. So what a deep plane lift typically does is it will actually create a dissection plane underneath that second layer. An extended deep plane lift will take that a little further and will actually take a, or incise and release multiple anchoring points that keep that SMAS in its place. And so the reason why the extended deep plane lift, I favor it, is because when you free that up, you're able to, without any tension, elevate and secure that SMAS layer and everything goes with it. So the skin and everything will go with that SMAS because it's, it's doing all the heavy lifting. That's basically a deep plane lift. The Platysmoplasty is a procedure within all types of aging face surgery that you can do as an adjunct. And I often will do it with the deep plane lift. So it's, it's just kind of part of it in, in most of the cases that I do. What a platysmoplasty is, it's you uh, access it by a small incision underneath the chin. So it's behind the chin crease. So it's virtually invisible. Um, and you will lift a subcutaneous flap all the way around the bottom of the neck here. So in many patients, um, there, there are a couple main reasons why to do it. So some patients have a lot of banding and that banding is actually the center edge of the right and the left platysma. The platysma is a very large sheet like muscle thin, thin and wide that goes right here on one side and here on the other side. You can demonstrate that by kind of showing your bottom teeth. You can feel it flex. And in some patients, even at rest, you'll get these real big bands. If you have a good amount of banding, um, platysmoplasty is the way to go. Other reason to do it would be if, if, if we determine that we feel like there's a lot of extra fat and soft tissue um, underneath the platysma that can't be reached through traditional means such as liposuction or uh, radiofrequency assisted lipolysis or anything that goes in that subcutaneous layer. Because it's not um, always fat that's above the platysma and between the skin, it's deep to the platysma as well. So in patients who have soft tissue there. And some patients are actually born 
without a sharp neckline. And it's a way to redefine that cervical mental angle, would call it. Cervical mental angle, all that means is neck to chin angle. And some people even just through congenital, you know, just from development or heredity, they have a very straight line down that way. And so there are ways that you can create more of that angle. So what does it entail? So that small incision that I was talking about, lifting up that uh, subcutaneous layer, we then find and identify both of the edges of the platysma. We'll actually elevate under the platysma, clear out some of the, the excess fat and soft tissue. And once we're happy with that flat contour, then we actually will bring the platysma back toward the midline and we will sew those edges that normally are together and put them together. I mean, normally apart and put them together. That then creates this hammock and we're able to use through our incisions around the ears from the, from the deep plane lift, we're able to pull laterally and it just creates this uninterrupted lift here. Okay. Now we're going to go through my progress pictures from the day after surgery all the way through about five weeks and hopefully um, give you guys a little bit of perspective on my healing process. Okay. Let's roll those. This is the day of surgery and I actually didn't take any other pictures besides this. I was so out of it, but I do have this bandage that wraps around my forehead and then goes underneath my chin. And I had two drains that were placed kind of back by my ears um, on my neck. And then this is the next day after surgery when they took the bandage off and they took the drains out and I was able to go back home and wash my hair. Actually, I was at my parents' house, wash my hair. And I kind of felt pretty good at this point. I wasn't taking any pain medication. I had no pain and the swelling and the bruising had not fully kicked in. So then you get to day three and that swelling really starts to kick in. I remember looking in the mirror and thinking I did not even look human. It's so distorting. And of course the bruising around the eyes is incredible. Now the eyelids definitely had this very firm, you know, incision in it and, but it wasn't uncomfortable in any way. There was really no pain whatsoever. Day three, I started to do some red light therapy. I felt that it was so relaxing and it really felt like I was being a little bit proactive with my healing and it was just very, very soothing to do. Then on day six, you can see that the swelling is persistent, but the bruising is actually sort of starting to yellow, which of course it's on its way out. So that was, you know, something to look forward to, to getting rid of those dark circles, but the swelling was crazy. I would say I peaked on day seven here. You can see my face was completely distorted. I did not look like myself in any way. It was the day that I looked in the mirror and thought, oh my gosh, what did I do? Which almost everybody has after they have some kind of a surgery like this, you kind of wonder if you've made a mistake because you're so swollen and bruised, etc., and you're cooped up. But then by day nine, the swelling had started to move down my face. I still had swollen under eyes, but it was down at my jaw as well. I wanted you to be able to see the swollen jawline, the swollen under eyes, but the bruising is starting to fade on my eyes. This is day 10. The bruising was light enough that I was able to cover it with a concealer and do a Facebook live in my private Facebook group, which you should join if you haven't already. This is day 11. I was able to put makeup on and go to the grocery store. Woohoo! It was really, really nice. I covered the scars with a beanie cap. So that was my trick that day. This is day 12. I actually felt good enough to pull my hair back and ride to Costco with my husband. You can see the swelling at the jawline is pronounced though. Now day 15, I'm still very swollen, but that bruising around the eyes is completely gone. The incision on the eye is pretty swollen though. Now this is 16 days after surgery. I just wanted you to see what it looks like with makeup and just a couple weeks after surgery. Now this is four weeks later and I feel like the scar is healing up really nicely. I'm able to easily conceal it. It was so finely done that it was really not a problem. Five weeks after surgery, the swelling is starting to go down, but it does come and go. Sometimes I will be really swollen still and other times not at all. 
This is my six month check-in with Dr. Kim. I really wanted to share this again because it does show that subtle result. What I really wanted to point out is what a difference that upper blepharoplasty made. I actually think it probably made the biggest difference of everything that I did, which is not what I expected at all. Remember that between that before and that after, there were lots of ups and lots of downs. So still to this day, nine months out, I definitely have days when I feel more swollen, other days that I don't. So just be patient if you're going through this. And if you're planning to do this, definitely plan on a full year of recovery and just have to have patience with it. We are the most beautiful when we feel the best about ourselves. No one needs plastic surgery. No one needs makeup. No one needs, you know, Botox certainly, or no one needs to get facials, but whatever it is that makes you feel the best about yourself that's what is the best thing for you. So ultimately it comes down to what you feel is best for you and what makes you feel the best and reflects the inside on the outside. Now, the last thing that I think is the most important as far as I am concerned is that we should never confuse surgery, Botox, filler with skincare. It is super duper important that we care for our skin. And I can tell you that skin that isn't taken care of, it doesn't matter how much Botox you do. It doesn't matter how much filler you put in your face. It doesn't matter if you go get a facelift. You are not going to look as good as you can if you don't have healthy skin. So skincare is imperative. I kind of think about it like you wouldn't go to the dentist just twice a year and never brush your teeth in between. You certainly wouldn't go get Botox once or twice a year, three times a year, go get a facelift once in your life, but never do any kind of maintenance skincare all along the way and expect for things to look as good as they could or be as healthy as they can. So it's super important not to confuse the two things. Now, I do know that a lot of people have asked about you know, at home things. For me personally, all of those things are just part of the brush in the teeth, the microcurrent and the at home radio frequency, and certainly all of the skincare that helps take care of things like hyperpigmentation, etc. Those are all just the brush in your teeth things. And then these other things might be the actual dental visit occasionally. Hopefully that makes sense. I do hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that it was helpful. If you can check out my video, my interview with Dr. Kim, the full interview. And if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them in the comment section. I'm going to get to you as soon as I can. I can make a follow-up video to this. If there are a bunch of questions that you guys have, I could do a Q and A about all of this. If I didn't hit some of the things that you were interested in. I took a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this video because it's a lot bigger than just slapping on some pictures about my progress. So I hope that you guys liked this video and I will talk to you in my next skincare video. Take care.